Thank you very much. So I will also stop my video uh, to save a little bit of bandwidth. Um, and uh, I would like to add that this presentation is uh, uh, going to be uh, about 30 minutes long. And I would like to start also with a disclaimer. So I'm not going to present you everything about Raman spectroscopy. I'm not going in depth uh, in the theory of this method because uh, uh, I will present you only what is instrumental to understanding then the remainder of my talk. And then also uh, in presenting you what you can learn about photoelectrics with Raman spectroscopy, I will make uh, just a few examples. Uh, we don't have a lot of time here. And if you're interested, however, to know a little bit more about this uh, technique, you are very much welcome to uh, send me an email to this email address, which is also uh, repeated in all the slides. So uh, what I will present you today is uh, uh, that we can learn about phase transitions in ferroelectrics with uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy. We can learn also uh, about crystalline texture chemical bonding and disorder and defects. And I will present you a few examples about all these aspects here. So this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, first of all uh, present a little bit of history of Raman spectroscopy and then a little bit of theory. Most importantly, I will show you what we can learn from, from a Raman spectrum, so which parameters we can extract from there and uh, then present you uh, just one slide about Raman spectroscopic equipment and then the examples that I already mentioned. Raman spectroscopy was uh, uh, discovered, or the Raman effect was discovered by Sir Chandrasekhar Venkata Raman, an Indian scientist in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, this is uh, actually the paper that he published in 1928 on nature. So um, the idea was uh, to understand whether a phenomenon similar to the Compton effect, which is the inelastic scattering of X-rays, uh, does occur also in other uh, electromagnetic radiation, such as in light. And so the experiment that he performed was the following. He used the, as a light source the sun, and he focused sunlight into a material, in this case a liquid, passing it through a color filter, so that only one specific wavelength was passed. Then he observed the light coming out of the sample using a filter that was able to cut only the lambda one radiation. And uh, he was able this way to observe that light was still passing through the filter, which means that the past light had a different wavelength. And this light uh, was very feeble and it was also polarized, which meant that uh, it's, uh, uh, it was not, for example, photoluminescence, uh, but it was indeed a scattering effect. So we uh, can scatter light uh, either elastically or inelastically from a solid. And in the case of elastic scattering, there is no energy exchange between the light and the solid or the liquid, let's say, uh, we would be concerned only with solid materials from now on. And so the scattered radiation has an energy which is identical to the energy of the incoming radiation. This is the so-called Rayleigh scattering, which is also the reason why the sky is blue. Raman scattering is a form of inelastic scattering from optical phonons. It means that the incident radiation interacts with the vibrational energy of the solid and the scattered light has an energy which is a function of the energy of the incident light and the vibrational energy of the solid. So anything that modifies the vibrational energy of the solid, such as, for example, the presence of strain or a different phase and so on, will leave a trace in the Raman spectrum so that we can say that the Raman spectrum is a fingerprint of the investigated substance. A Raman spectrum looks like this. We will see very different uh, peaks. And if we um, represent the spectrum in terms of wave numbers shift from the incident radiation, we will see a very uh, strong radiation at zero position, which is the Rayleigh light, the elastically scattered light. 
and then um, mirrored from it, we will see the Stokes lines and the anti-Stokes lines. They are at the same position, but in one case, we are talking about the energy loss, in the other case, we're talking about an energy gain. Now, the Stokes lines, they are the most intense because at room temperature, the Stokes process, which originates at the ground state, is most probable. And so in Raman spectroscopy, generally only the Stokes lines are measured. So this is the Raman spectrum of chloroform. As you see in the Raman shift here, we take the, um, we represent it as a shift from the excitation frequency and we take by convention, the negative absolute frequency shift as positive, which means that positive shift is given to the Stokes lines and the negative shift to the anti-Stokes lines. Although the Stokes lines, they have a lower energy than the incident radiation. So these peaks in the Raman spectrum, they are specific vibrational modes of the uh, molecule or of the crystal lattice. So for example, in a carbon nanotube, we might have a radial breathing mode or a G-band, which is related to the aromatic rings. In the case of gallium nitride, we have very different phonon modes, which uh, uh, depend on the uh, symmetry of these uh, vibrations between gallium and nitrogen atoms in the primitive unit cell of gallium nitride. So uh, each of these modes uh, will give rise to a peak in the Raman spectrum. And it will be possible also to assign which peaks belong to which uh, vibrations. So what are the parameters that we can extract from Raman spectrum? They are peak position, peak intensity, and peak width. Peak position depends on the energy. So we can say that it depends on the strength of the atomic bond and is influenced by any changes in the bond distance or the spring, spring constant. So any change in the atomic mass, hybridization, electrostatic forces, spin forces, or strain will produce a shift in the Raman peak position. Peak intensity depends on the polarizability of the bond and is influenced by any changes in the phase amount, the crystal orientation, and the charge transfer. So the intensity will be higher if uh, a higher fraction of a certain phase producing that peak is present. Peak width depends on the coherency of vibration and is influenced by temperature and disorder. So very similar to what happens in X-rays, in a single crystal, we will see sharp peaks. And in the case of an amorphous material, we will see broad peaks. This is a schematic of a Raman spectrometer. Uh, it's a Horiba Jobenibon T64000, which is one of the most famous Raman spectrometers uh, on the market. The incident radiation is a monochromatic laser, which is focused onto the sample, which is placed on an XYZ table, through a microscope objective. And the light that is scattered from the sample, so the elastically and inelastically scattered light, is collected by the same objective. Now, as you have seen before, the elastically scattered light is uh, much more intense than the Raman scattered light. Actually, the difference is about uh, six orders of magnitude. So we need to filter the light coming from the sample and uh, uh, reject all the elastically scattered contribution and pass to the spectrometer only the inelastically scattered light. Within the spectrometer, which is based uh, generally on a grating, light is dispersed and is visualized with a photon counting device such as a CCD on the computer screen as a spectrum. So the first take home messages for today is 
are that Raman spectroscopy is an inelastic scattering process by optical phonons excited by monochromatic radiation. The Raman spectrum is a fingerprint of the solid under examination. Peak position, density and width are the most important parameters we can extract and they are directly related with material properties. And the Raman spectrometer is constituted essentially by a laser, a microscope, a monochromator, and a detector. So we will start now seeing um, what we can learn with Raman in ferroelectric materials. And I will start with phase transitions. And in particular, phase transitions in barium titanate, which is the prototype ferroelectric material. This is the Raman spectrum of barium titanate at very low temperatures around uh, the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And what we see here in this spectrum is the presence of these sharp peaks below 200 and a sharp peak at around 490 reciprocal centimeters. This is the signature of the rhomboedral phase in barium titanate. If we increase the temperature, then at a certain point, we will see that these modes below 200 um, have a reduced intensity and there has been a shift of the mode on 490. This is uh, what happens in the autorhombic phase of barium titanate. Further, increasing temperature and going up to uh, room temperature, we see a shift of the mode at 270 and the disappearance of the mode at 490. And this is what happens in the tetragonal phase of barium titan. Now, all these uh, three phases, they have something in common, namely they are ferroelectric. And we can see also something uh, in common uh, in all of these uh, three Raman spectra, namely these three modes here. This sharp mode here, there's a dip at 180, and this mode at around 715. These modes, they are related to the uh, cooperative displacement of uh, um, titanium atoms with respect to the rest of the unit cells. And so it means that they are related with the presence of uh, uh, ferroelectric order. In fact, when we increase the temperature above the Curie point, all these modes disappear. So you, you see it is very, um, very easy to distinguish between the different phases in barium titanate. And then it is possible also to distinguish very well where the transition points are. So here I placed the, the spectra uh, in, in two dimensions. And so red means high intensity and blue means low intensity. And as you see here, in correspondence of the phase transitions, we have abrupt changes in the Raman spectrum, namely changes in intensity of the peaks, disappearance of peaks, and also uh, shifts in the peak position of some selected peaks. So this we can say for um, phase transitions that have um, um, mostly a first order character. But what happens if we have some transition which, uh, which does not have a first order character, which for example, the case of relaxor materials, such as uh, bismuth, sodium titanate, barium titanate, in correspondence of the depolarization temperature for low barium titanate contents. So here, we have to consider that uh, we will have a smooth change in the order parameter um, compared to, to the case of barium titanate. And uh, so we have to rely on a, on a different uh, uh, mechanism, on a different uh, uh, analysis in order to detect the phase transition. If we trace now the peak position of one of the peaks in bismuth sodium titanate with temperature, we see that there is no abrupt change across the depolarization temperature. But if we uh, reproduce the peak position uh, in terms of anharmonic phonon softening, which is uh, something that always happens as a function of temperature, we see that we cannot reproduce this uh, uh, behavior with only one curve with this functional form. 
but we need two of these curves and these two curves they join at around 160 degrees C which is uh, the depolarization temperature of bismuth sodium titanate. So these anomalies in the softening behavior can help us in detecting transitions that do not have fully first order character. All right, now I would like to show you how you can measure crystalline texture in uh, ferroelectrics using Raman spectroscopy. And here you need to perform uh, polarized Raman measurements. Namely, you place your sample under the microscope. The incident laser light must be polarized and also you must uh, uh, analyze the scattered light with a linear polarizer. Then you have to maintain fixed this polarization configuration and rotate the sample. And what you obtain is that, uh, for example, in a single crystal like, a, like quartz, you will see that selected modes, they will have a sinusoidal intensity dependence as a function of the rotation angle. And this intensity dependence is, uh, is different depending on the symmetry of the mode under consideration. So depending on the uh, vibrational mode. Uh, the reason for this is that the intensity can be represented by this equation where EI and ES are the polarization vectors of the incident and scattered light and R is the so-called Raman tensor which gives you the directionality of uh, uh, Raman modes with respect to the um, principal axis of the crystal. So if you uh, transform this in terms of the Euler angles you will have a sinusoidal relationship and the shape, so the periodicity of this sinusoidal relationship depends on the shape of the Raman tensor. So you can assign then uh, the symmetry to different, to different modes. Uh, what happens, however, in the case of a uh, polycrystalline material? Well, when you perform your measurement, you will always be um, measuring in a certain volume and this volume has a certain distribution of crystallites or of ferroelectric domains if the material is, uh, is a ferroelectric. Each domain will be described by a pair of angles and if we then rotate the crystal, um, the observed intensity dependence as a function of rotation angle will be a combination of the intensity dependence for each single domain and multiplied by the domain orientation distribution function. So to give you an example, let's see what happens when we place a vicus indentation in a barium titanate polycrystal. Because of the ferroelastic effect, there will be one area around the indentation where the domains will have be preferentially oriented in one direction. And so if we um, analyze um, and carry out this uh, rotation around in the vicinity of the indentation, we will see that we obtain a very strong intensity dependence. But as soon as we go away from the indentation, we see that the intensity loses its strength, we can say, and eventually we will see no intensity dependence when we are far away enough from the indentation. This means that here the domains are randomly oriented, whereas here in the vicinity of the indentation, they have a preferential orientation. So it is clear that we have information about texture that is buried into this uh, intensity dependence of Raman peaks. And how can we extract it? Well, we need to um, simulate the um, uh, domain distribution and use it to best fit the, uh, the Raman data with a reverse Monte Carlo model. So at the beginning we generate randomly oriented domains and we switch one domain at a time according to the underlying crystal symmetry. Then with this we can calculate the Raman intensity of the whole ensemble and compare it with the measured one. And then we perform an iterative procedure so that at the end we come out with the best fit and uh, the domain distribution corresponding to this best fit 
is the closest to the real one in the material. Let me show you how this works. So at the beginning, uh, we, so we want to um, fit experimental data that we obtain on a polled ferroelectric polycrystal. And this is the red one is the experimental curve and the black one is the calculation based on the assumed domain distribution. So the initial state is isotropic and so the calculation of course does not correspond to the measured data. But as soon as we start the iterative procedure, we see that the domains, they tend to switch and to orient themselves in the direction of the polling direction of the ferroelectric. And also the calculated curve comes closer until we will have a best fit from which we can extract an orientation distribution function. So we have performed uh, such calculations on based on different experimental data taken on different uh, differently oriented ferroelectric polycrystals. In the case of an unpolled material, the best fit was indeed the isotropic distribution. So the domains are here randomly oriented. In the case of a polled ferroelectric, uh, we obtain a strong texture in the direction of the polling. And in the case of the compressed, mechanically compressed ferroelectric, the texture was strong um, in the direction perpendicular to the axis of mechanical compression. And this is exactly what we can expect from uh, the ferroelastic effect. All right, we are now um, concerned with uh, the analysis of chemical bonding aspects in ferroelectrics using Raman spectroscopy. And here I would like to uh, talk about, uh, uh, again, bismuth, sodium titanate, barium titanate, but um, the barium titanate rich compositions. Because here we have seen a very interesting effect, namely by increasing the amount of uh, bismuth and sodium, the Curie temperature and the lattice distortion increased. And this points towards an increase of tetragonality. This result is somewhat counterintuitive if we reason just based on the ionic size because uh, bismuth and sodium are smaller than barium. And if a smaller cation is substituted, the cubic phase and not the tetragonal one should be stabilized. For example, as it happens in strontium substituted barium titanate, it becomes more cubic. And the Curie temperature also decreases. The um, result that we obtained is much more similar to what happens if lead is substituted uh, at the place of, uh, of barium namely higher Curie temperature and uh, uh, more tetragonal uh, crystal. And indeed, there are similarities between lead and bismuth because both lead and bismuth substitute at the A site and they possess a lone electron pair which can produce uh, a hybridization between the A site and the oxygen. In other words, the bonding character at the A site changes from being purely ionic to being covalent and this produces a polyhedral distortion, which is in the case of lead directed only along the 001 direction of the unit cell. In the case of bismuth, uh, also along the 110 direction, thus producing a skewing of the oxygen octahedra. So the question is whether uh, it is possible to detect those changes with Raman spectroscopy, to use Raman spectroscopy to um, confirm that this is indeed the mechanism that occurs. And to do this, we need to look for changes in the titanium oxygen vibration and changes in the uh, vibrations related to the oxygen octahedra. Fortunately, in these materials, uh, we can uh, single out the um, vibrations that are the peaks that are responsible for these vibrations. So below 150, we have peaks mostly related to A site. And uh, between 200 and 400, namely this feature here is related to the titanium oxygen bond. And these features here are due to oxygen octahedra 
namely oxygen atoms within the oxygen octahedra. And so we need to concentrate our attention on these three groups of modes. And what we see, now I'm showing you the experimental results in barium titanate substituted with bismuth sodium titanate. And what we see is that we have a coherent shift of these three groups of modes by increasing the amount of bismuth sodium titanate. And this means that we have here an increased distortion along the 001 direction and along the 110 direction. And this confirms that we have an increased covalent character due to the lone pair effect of bismuth. Um, we see also a broadening of the modes, which might, in, in, uh, might mean that we have an increase in disorder. Uh, and we might have the formation of A-site clusters because the appearance of this peak could be ascribed also to two-mode behavior. What does this mean? Uh, I will tell you in a few slides when we talk about disorder. Um, so, and now we, are, we come to the last part of the talk. What is the effect of local disorder on Raman spectra? I was talking about broadening before, I was talking about extra modes, and namely this is what, what happens. Um, disorder in a, in a ferroelectric material, in a perovskite, uh, but this is valid for all crystal structures, so disorder um, produces an activation of phonon modes outside the Brillouin zone center. In a perfect crystal, Raman uh, modes, they are originate only from the center of the Brillouin zone. When disorder is present, and this disorder has a certain structural coherence, then a larger portion of the phonon spectrum within the first Brillouin zone is visible. And this produces a broadening of the Raman modes. One example can be seen here in this zirconium substituted barium titanate. So all these spectra were taken at 77 Kelvin, so very low temperature. And in pure barium titanate, we obtain very sharp peaks. But if we start increasing the amount of zirconium, we see that the peaks become very broad because of the translational disorder. Another effect of disorder that can be visualized by Raman spectroscopy is the presence of atomic clusters, namely nano-sized regions that are richer in one substituent with respect to the other. And this gives rise to the two-mode behavior because regions richer in one chemical species will vibrate differently because of difference in ion mass and produce local additional Raman modes. And this um, local additional Raman modes will produce a broadening will increase the intensity with increased substituent content, will produce broadening, and in some cases, even splitting of uh, uh, the visible spectral features. And this can be seen very well here in this uh, potassium substituted sodium bismuth titanate, increasing the amount uh, of uh, uh, sodium bismuth titanate. We see the appearance of this peak here. Also, uh, uncorrelated ion displacements in the cubic phase uh, of, uh, uh, of ferroelectrics, in the paraelectric phase of ferroelectrics, can be visualized by Raman spectroscopy because also these uncorrelated ion displacements will break the cubic symmetry and give rise to Raman activity. And uh, this is the reason why, above the Curie temperature, even if the um, barium titanate crystals should be cubic and centrosymmetric and so should not show Raman activity, we see a Raman spectrum. And this spectrum here is due to the fact that we have some um, uncorrelate ion displacement in the paraelectric phase. Also defects can be visualized uh, in uh, ferroelectrics using Raman spectroscopy. Point defects, in fact, they vibrate with their own frequency, similar to substituents. And there are two cases that we have to consider. If the frequency is similar to that of the Raman modes, we have uh, a certain extended disorder that makes uh, uh, the Raman spectrum resemble the whole phonon density of states, as you can see here 
in the case of an indium nitride semiconductor doped with uh, charged nitrogen ions. Uh, in the case, uh, uh, the frequency of the point defect is higher than that of phonon bands, a localized mode appears as a narrow band. As you can see here in these uh, uh, two barium titanate based materials, so this is barium titanate substituted with niobium and with lanthanum. So when you substitute lanthanum at the A site or niobium at the B site, uh, for charge compensation, you create titanium vacancies, and that's why you obtain this uh, sharp mode at around 830. This mode, as you can see, is, uh, is not present in this, in this way in, uh, in a material where uh, we have charge compensation, uh, so namely where both niobium and gallium, so 5 plus and 3 plus, are substituted on the B side. So this mode here uh, proves that we have titanium vacancies in the uh, perovskite lattice. And so we are almost at the end. And I hope that I have showed you that uh, we can learn a lot of things in ferroelectrics using Raman spectroscopy, uh, in particular from the analysis, uh, from the visual analysis of the Raman spectral signature we can detect the different phases and phase transitions, also as a function of external stimuli. Using the intensity of Raman modes in a polarized configuration, we can study crystal orientation and texture. Seeing changes in the Raman peak position, we can detect uh, uh, changes in the bonding character or presence of chemical stress. We can visualize uh, presence of disorder or different phases or short range, on the short range using uh, um, also visual examination of the Raman spectrum and for example, in the case of broadening or peak splitting and the defects can be detected by the appearance of uh, extra Raman modes as I have just shown you. So, and uh, uh, with that, I would like to conclude and I thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, and uh, uh, in any case, you're always most welcome to send me emails if you would like to have more in-depth uh, um, information about Raman spectroscopy.